right, we are introducing now, and I still haven't come up with a name for it, because you know when you get the name for a program segment or something, you know when you've got the right name, and I cannot for the life of me. Look, look, all the other boring media have the panel or our forum, um, and it's a format, and it's quite a good format because you it's less structured, it's more fun than getting someone in for a specific interview on something. Oh, but you look at all the political programs and, you know, hand-wringing Radio New Zealand, and they have basically the same roster of commentators, um, and they get on people like, I'm just trying to think of his names, that, that grifter Shane Tapoe will come on, former unionist. Uh, you'll have this guy Morgan Godfrey, who's a unionist, um, and they always love having like 20 or 30-something millennial political staffers, and they say former political staffer. And it's like someone who made the coffee in some bank benches office for six months for the National Party um, and did half a political science degree, and suddenly they're the font of all knowledge. Or they just have people like Mike Williams. And not that I don't dislike any of these people, and if you invite me on the show, I'd like you to come. If I invite you on the show, I'd like to come. But basically, there's a roster of fairly boring people who are essentially proxies for political parties who are the commentariat of this country. And I just think we've got a whole lot more talent and a whole lot more entertainment across a much broader cross-section of New Zealanders. Um, so I am going to start every Friday to start off with for half an hour. I'll be inviting a couple of people to join us on the line to just talk in general about the events of the week and have a good time. And I here's the criteria I choose people on. They're smart, they're entertaining, and they ain't uh, boring. Uh, and they're good folk. They're not dickheads. And this morning, so the inaugural as yet unnamed panel show on Sean Plunkett's platform radio show, not radio show, the two people we've got in today, and now our first one, I am loath to give her any introduction. She was really pissed off at the way I introduced her last time she was on the show. So I'm going to give her the right to introduce herself. Her name is Rachel Stewart. That's all I'm going to say in case she loses her stuff at me. Rachel, tell <laughs> people who you are. Oh, <laughs> that's just too much. But how are you this morning, heterosexual, oh, Sean? Oh, heterosexual, Sean. I may have mentioned your gender preference. I don't know. You okay. may have. In, in, in the opening line, yes. Okay. I also mentioned you were as a farmer. That would be far more insulting yeah. to many people. Uh, Rachel, yeah. you're a former Herald columnist. Do you live a rural lifestyle? You shoot the odd gun off. And I think you're one of our better and more interesting writers across a whole range of subjects. Is that all right? Can we go with that? Yes, thank you. Thank you. And a non-dickhead. And a non-dickhead, all right. And you could call the panel a non-dickhead. Yeah, and our other panellist is a guy who until now has been a newsmaker. He's very interested. He's actually an internationally renowned researcher in the age at which people lose their virginity. He's an amateur pugilist <laughs> and former <laughs> local body uh, Merrill Hopeful in Auckland. He's also a publican and a good guy to have a beer and a yarn with. Um, someone who knows a bit about horse racing and all sorts of other strange uh, things. The only challenge he has in life is his height, but his feet do reach the ground. His name's Leo Malloy, and he joins us now. Leo, uh, welcome to the platform. Lovely to have you with us. I guess if you were allowed to write your own um, character reference or intro, what would you describe yourself as these days? Uh, just two letters, GC, absolute GC. <laughs> Very good. Now, I have to ask, and I didn't think of this beforehand, have you two ever met, met each other? No. No. Okay, I'll go first. I had to ask you, um, I don't know who it was doing your producing today, I had to ask about Rachel's background, and I got a one-paragraph version. I did rather like the cut of her jib, I've got to say, the way it was described. I thought I can resonate with that. Very similar to myself, if I may say so. All right. All right. Okay, so on an intellectual level, maybe there's a meeting of minds here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We shall see. And, it's a, and it's a GC, so am I. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a gender critical. All right. <laughs> Maybe we should call this thing. I'm still looking for, for a name for it. Maybe we call it GC Friday. Yeah, well, I, I like oh, it. Oh, TFGC <laughs> Friday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, let, let's get into it now. Let's see how this program runs. And I want to start with something I haven't done any interviews on this week. And it was amazing in the office. We have largely younger people working in the platform office. 
and the news came through, I think it was, was it Monday or Tuesday, that Gorbachev had died. And, man, that brought back memories. And he was quite something. He was the guy that almost willingly lost the Cold War. Your thoughts, Rachel, on the passing of Gorby? Well, I didn't have too many thoughts about it. I mean, I just, I thought of his birth mark. I looked at him. He looked at obviously 90-something. My <laughs> thoughts were, weren't times um, a little bit easier in the 80s when the Berlin Wall fell in 89 and everything sort of opened up. It just brings back lovely memories of this progress that we thought we were all, all going to get. But actually, New Zealand feels like there's a Berlin Wall going up now. So I'm not sure how far we've come, but quite fond of him, actually. Yeah, and it was amazing. Someone, I saw a picture somewhere, Leo, of uh, George Bush Sr., uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, someone else who I forget, and they were standing in front of the World Trade Centre and someone said, all people in this photograph are dead now and the buildings don't even exist. What a different time, how quickly the world changes. Leo, you must have been a Gorbachev fan. Yeah, I was a Gorby fan. I think he, um, he liberated the Soviet Union, obviously brought down the Berlin Wall as Rachel just mentioned, or effectively brought down the Berlin Wall. But what I find intriguing about the dynamics here is how contrasting opposites invari invariably bring down barriers. Nixon and the Sino barrier, um, Ronnie Reagan, who I wasn't a fan of initially, but ended up being a fan of for a multitude of reasons. Some, I didn't approve of everything he did and said, but he was a good politician, um, ha having been an actor prior, which I didn't think was the necessary qualifying criteria to be a president. But they got on really well, and he's done a good job. I've got to say the current bloke who's incumbent in the office up there hasn't done quite such a good job, and I see he's not going to Mikhail Gorbachev's funeral, which is rather offensive and insulting in my view. But he certainly made a mark in history, along with some of the great peacemakers of our time, Madeleine Albright, Henry Kissinger, those sort of people. So it was an elite club that he was a part of. I notice also, actually, someone mentioned, I think today is the 30th anniversary of the death of Princess Diana. 25th. 25th, is it? Okay, I'm getting, yeah. I'm not as old as I think. 20, I can yeah. remember, I hate to say it, Rachel, I can remember where I was when I heard the news that she'd died. Well, who can't? I, I, it was, yeah, it was massive. It was big. It was terrible. It was exciting. It was awful. It was everything. Um, sad day. It was a sad day, and it's been sad for 25 years ever since. And watching Harry go off the rails like he seems to be doing is... Uh, I blame I'm Megan. Sure you know did. that's Megan's fault. You know, he's just a bad partner. Yeah. He made a bad choice, didn't he? It looks like it. Looks <laughs> like it. Leo, were you a Princess Di fan? Well, I'm certainly not a royalist, but I did admire her qualities. I liked her rebellious streak, and I liked the fact she was fairly generous with her favours. All right. I think that, um, who, who's the last person who got a turn there? Dodi al Fayed, wasn't it? Yeah. She certainly did the rounds, and she broke a few shackles, I've got to say. She certainly... The, the royal family, in my view, is very stuffy and rather inbred. She at least brought a new, refreshing sort of a... Um, um, how would you describe it? A different window to look through when you're viewing the royal family. All right. Now, yeah. let's move on to the... And we did an interview this morning with Michael Baker... You may not like Professor Michael Baker, but at least he fronts mm. up and is prepared yeah. to be interviewed. And the government is now going through a review of the traffic light system, and we might get rid of the masks. The infection rates, the death rates on COVID are coming down incredibly quickly. Do we need to... And I'm wondering, Rachel, rather than review the traffic light system, maybe we just need to get rid of it altogether. Actually, we should probably review the government, but that's a whole other subject. Oh, we get to do that um, next year. Yeah, yeah. I think we should just be doing what the... I mean, there's a whole world out there that is just getting on with it. If you go anywhere at the moment in the world, if you go to Australia, you go anywhere, the people are acting like it's over, it's done. We seem to be the last vestige of hanging on to fear. Um, so, yes, I think it's time to just uh, get everybody back to work Um Apologise to them for kicking them out, nurses and midwives, yeah. and move on, yes. What about masks? What about statutory times off work? No. Oh. Me or Rachel, who's having a turn oh, now? Either. Now, this is the thing. I just want to say to you, don't be bloody polite. Neither of you are yeah. in private conversation, so why <laughs> change the habit of a lifetime? <laughs> Go, Leo. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm a huge critic of their COVID strategy. I think they've been um, they've embarrassed the country. They've embarrassed themselves. They've proved as if they had to prove again how inept and how incompetent they are. Michael Baker's a wintering little prick. He's just a lab rat. He should get back into the bowels of the university where he belonged. He doesn't deserve the exposure he's had, and he's been wrong on almost every count along the way. I still. No, I he speaks highly of you too, Leo. Yeah. 
I was, I was at an event the other night and he tweeted that it was a super spreader event. There's about 15 people at a council debate, which is fairly average, a mayoral debate at an underground club called Calibre up in K Row. But that's the measure of the man, that that's a super spreader event when there's 15 people in, in a dungeon bar. But mm. I have no affection or time for him at all. I think the government let the academics have far too much say in this. A lot of them have gone to ground. Sean Hendy, for example, has gone to ground. All the modellers, Rod Jackson, has gone to ground. And that's where they belong. They should go back there. Michael Baker should follow them. We need to get on with our life. And the next time, if we ever have another pandemic, they should listen to the advice of the business community in conjunction with the academic community, get some balance into the situation because no one, and I mean no one, wants to come to New Zealand now. And we have drastic issues evolving here, particularly with staff shortages across all sectors. But why would you want to come to New Zealand? I mean, social media is full of micro stories about waiting three hours at immigration, but the reality is it's almost impossible to get here. And nobody's got staff in New Zealand. We're fueling inflation. You mentioned Shane Tapau in the intro. Shane Tapau is a sad indictment of Auckland society. He's just a, well, I'm going to be frank here. He's turned out to be a bludger and he doesn't understand inflation. He doesn't understand monetary policy or fiscal policy, but he's got an opinion about everything. I think Shane Tapau should be put to bed as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> tell us what you really feel, Leo. Rachel, the interesting thing in talking to Michael Baker we have through legislation we are still under we've still given health officials emergency powers to mess with our lives and my mm. argument was prior to the pandemic you get the flu which is an infectious disease and people were quite capable of making their own decisions of how long they stayed at home and how they protected themselves but in two years through this sort of government program of mind control it seems to me a lot of people have become rather dependent on nanny state telling them what they should do in any given situation. Oh, that's perfect for the people that um, say they're feeling whatever or, yes, I've got COVID, but how do you prove it? Um, lots of people have, have used the system um, and, you know, the wage subsidy too. Um, so it's a perfect situation for people that really don't like working very hard. We seem to have a country that is going that way. Um, yes, I think it's been um, used and it needs to go, the whole thing. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a minefield. Though. I'm just disgusted. I'm with Leo on the whole thing. I think we've completely cocked it up all the way through and we'll continue to keep doing that until we get, get rid of whoever's in charge of making these stupid decisions. All right, I hear you. All right, guys, we're going to have a break and when we come back, I'm going to talk about, and Leo, I'm going to give you the lead on this, the hunt for Nazis at local body elections. All right, we're back. Uh, and look, I still, the un, as yet our unnamed panel show is in progress. We've got Rachel Stewart and Leo Malloy uh, wrapping up some of the events of the week and talking about current uh, affairs in New Zealand. Well, guys, there's this really weird thing happening in our legacy mainstream media. And now local government New Zealand ha have joined the campaign or the witch hunt for candidates that some group of academics at Massey University who call themselves Fact New Zealand or the Disinformation Project have deemed to be politically incorrect, have been deemed to be Nazis and threats to democracy. And rather than letting the people decide, we now have outfits like Local Government New Zealand, uh, Stuff, Radio New Zealand, Television New Zealand and News Hub going around trying to out candidates who have different political views than them. First up, your assessment, Leo, of whether or not this is fundamentally interference in people's right to make up their own minds, people's right to stand for local government. Well, clearly it hasn't escaped your attention. This is about as undemocratic as you can get when you're denying people the right to make a democratic decision, to make an elective decision based on the information at their disposal. And if voters can't be bothered finding out who they're voting for, that's probably a sad indictment of the, A, the state of the election, but B, the, the apathy that prevails out there in the local community. And people are disinterested for a reason. Because they've just lost interest. They have lost faith. They've lost confidence. But as if you're referring to Mr. Elton Christchurch, which I presume you are, I personally would never vote for him for a bloke like him either. But having said that, if you go back and look at the way the American um, elections have evolved, and I don't know if you're a Roger Stone fan. I find him amusing. I'm not a fan, nor am I a Trump fan, if that matters. But Roger Stone said that voting is so shallow over there they'll vote for the man with good hair ahead of the man who hasn't got good hair or in some in some cases i expect it'll be the woman with good hair but the reality is that voters they don't go deep at local body but they should and if you don't know the person you should never vote on name recognition alone name recognition is nothing otherwise mike hosking rang for prime minister he'd be prime minister and i like hosking i like his politics but you shouldn't be voting for those reasons you should be voting based on policy 
And if you can't be bothered looking at the policy, you probably shouldn't vote. And you certainly shouldn't have your thoughts channeled by a, a central government agency. That is bizarre. But they are because the only people being <coughs> being scrutinised here seem to be Voices for Freedom associated people, people who don't like the government's vaccine or COVID policies. They are the only ones being singled out by the mainstream media, by uh, local government New Zealand, as somehow hiding things from the public. But they completely gloss over candidates like Tory Farno in Wellington, who are, is clearly a Green Party candidate but doesn't say so. So it seems to me there's only one crime, according to mainstream news media, local government New Zealand and these very, very dodgy and untransparent um, disinformation groups, and that is someone who is to the right or not left in, in politics, Rachel. Yes, well, there's another crime too. I noticed a very disturbing um, article this morning and stuff about a woman called Jennifer Scott, who I don't know, who is a nurse, but she got mandated, uh, mandated out because she didn't get the jab. But further to that, she stood up against the Green Mayor of uh, Dunedin in submissions and said that she, she felt that uh, she didn't like trans uh, women in toilets and council-owned facilities in Dunedin. Uh, you may recall that Aaron Hawkins called her thoughts repugnant. She said nothing more than that. And this morning the nursing council have confirmed they've taken away her uh, licence to uh, her nursing licence. On what so, grounds? And I, look, I'm sorry, I've missed that because that is a story yeah. we will get into next week. On what grounds? Well, I tweeted it, I tweeted it this morning. You can see it there. Um, on the grounds that, well, the article, you know, how the media, particularly staff, are doing it, on the grounds that would sound like, because there's an investigation pending, that she didn't, that she's an anti-vaxxer and that she's an anti-transgender activist. All she did... That is was not a crime. Mission. That is an opinion. That's exactly right. And it's an opinion based on biology. When you're a nurse and you're on the operating table, you know who a man and a woman is, you know. Um, so she stood up and just told the that she participate. This is what gets me. You participate in local government. They want you to stand for certain things. She's not. But this is my point. She gave submissions and she was called repugnant and distasteful by the Green Mayor. That is morally reprehensible to me. And this is where the media is going. So yes, they're now. God, if they wanted to, if I stood for council, can you imagine that? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm obviously, I don't believe that men should be in our facilities and in our spaces, even if they weren't, you know, whatever, they, whatever, yeah. that there's a reason. I would be absolutely, so if I, someone said to me, would you stand for Mayor of Whanganui? I said, you've got to be joking. First of all, I would rather die in a ditch. But second of all, I would never make it. You yeah. know, it just wouldn't happen because I question things. I um, don't believe that men can change sex or women can change sex, you know. So this is what's happened to this woman, and you need to have a good look at that this morning. It's quite a story, I thought. Yeah, no, I certainly will. Leo, do you think the media are basically trying to witch hunt certain types of candidates out of standing for local body? And did you think, while you were running for mayor before you quit... Um, do you think you were given that word, please? Well, do you think you were given a, a fair crack? Yeah, no, I've got no complaint. I mean, I trade blows, and I, I, I'm prepared to receive because I give plenty, and it doesn't bother me. What I don't like is when they're attacking someone like the Vic, which they are now, and she's been to some extent let down by CNR, but they're fairly relentless the way they're dismembering her now, and I don't like that because um, she's not a person who trades blows. I don't personally feel like I was cancelled. I don't think anybody could cancel me. If anything, they just consolidate my brand and. <laughs> Help, they help me shine a little bit more pressure diamonds, you know, the cliche. But, yeah. yeah, I think the media does have a largely woke perspective. Although, having said that, some of them are quite balanced. I mean, I've mentioned one already on your show who's quite balanced. Yeah. There's two or three other commentators who offer a different perspective. But generally speaking, stuff in particular, very woke and very limp-wristed. Mm. Um, yeah. Some of the heralds, but not quite so bad. What does concern me is well, two things here concern me. They don't tend to look at people like Fesso Collins and his record of... Um, you know, he's got a very much play, play, playing the race card type uh, series of events over about four or five, maybe longer years now, where he does it for effect, and the media don't want to run that story. And I asked him, I said, why don't you run that story? Because he's got a lot of baggage there. And they said, well, he wants to move on from it. Well, they won't let Leo Malloy move on from anything I've done in my past, so why? how come the left are allowed to move mm. on? It's, it's kind of weird. But anyway, and they don't um, tend to look at anybody from the left, in my view. Anybody from the left gets a free pass. If anything, you get support. You can look at Simon Wilson, for example, in The Herald. He writes favourable articles about anybody who's got of a left persuasion but doesn't have a good word to say about anybody, no matter how, no matter how good your policies are, if you're deemed to be a centre-rightist. So. Yeah, well, what do you think about a nurse? What, you know, the thing that Rachel's just brought up, 
a nurse who has got views on transgender and maybe views about the vaccination being deregistered by her professional body. That just looks wrong to me. Well, it's no different to the bloke who was the wannabe presiding judge for Brian Tumak, his protest at Wellington, is it? I mean, at the end of the day, you make an elective decision in your own time. You arrive at your own opinions. You develop your own thoughts. Your own set your own moral compass the way you wish. I would. I certainly agree with Rachel about not being able to use dedicated female facilities if you're, you know, if you're transitioning in some way, shape, or form. But having said that, I also accept that sexuality is not binary. So you know, this, these people aren't. They're not to be marginalised or picked on in any way. Mm. But I think not that, not that have an opinion, sexuality, so. Leo. Not that it's sexuality. It's trans. This is a whole different subject. Yeah. It's it's trans. It's different. It's not sexuality. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Look, I want to bring up another story that we're following. This is this guy, Avi Yemeni, from Rebel News yeah. in Australia. Turned away at the border a couple of weeks ago, and we're trying to find out exactly why. And what mm. we have found and now established is that the Wellington Interpol, or New Zealand Police, simply decided they did not want this guy and his mate in New Zealand... And they went out looking for things to prevent him being granted access to New Zealand. Quite specifically, specific to the individual. And as far as we can establish, based on anonymous and erroneous claims made in the Herald. That seems mm. to me not to be applying, uh, applying our rules about entry to this country fairly and without favour. It looks to me like we are now formalising a form of political correctness or discrimination that the government can choose who comes here and whose views are acceptable or not. Rachel? Yeah, well, the only reason that Avi Yemeni should not have been left, let into the country is because of his man bun. Now, you may laugh. <laughs> <laughs> But it was the it was the other go if it was another government that really hated man buns. Yeah, and I can't say I'm a great fan because I usually speak of woke. Um, uh, that could happen. I mean, this is how absurd it is. They just didn't like the guy because he was coming to cover the protest. They didn't want covered. This is terrible. I mean, this is if people can't see democracy, democracy dying in front of their eyes, I don't know what I can say to them. This is the worst thing that could have happened and I think the New Zealand police have a lot to answer for here because yeah. it looks like they went looking for dirt and they got what they wanted. Yeah, and then they told immigration what to do and Monday the Prime Minister said immigration made that decision alone and I'm sorry, that's at variance with the facts as we now know them. Absolutely, but the facts aren't going to come out in the mainstream media, unfortunately, Sean. They'll come out with you and a few of us, but they're not going to come out in staff or New Zealand Herald, sadly. Yeah, Um Leo, do you worry if our police force become politicised, if you are discriminated against, whether you're a New Zealander or a foreigner, because you don't have acceptable political positions? I worry greatly. And I take you back to the day that Mike Bush was politicised by the Prime Minister when he went in to defend the Prime Minister's partner. That was, once they've set that precedent, you're on a slippery slope. When the police speak on behalf of the mm -hmm. government and the Prime Minister, mm -hmm. there is no way back from that. So mm. this is just an extension of exactly the same thing. And I don't know if you've had the opportunity to meet Andrew Costa. Yeah, uh, no, Andrew I Costa. haven't actually. And he hasn't given me an interview yet either. Well, no. that is the personification of what we're describing here. Yeah. All right. Now, and they did come and get my guns, remember, for, for reasons, you know, you That's and I right. You have, and look, that's in a, in a different way. And, and I, you know, I made something of that at the time, and a lot of people did, because that was the thin end of the wedge. Are the enemy yep. is a thicker part of the wedge, and the wedge just gets yep. bigger and bigger and bigger until, you know, <laughs> to mix metaphors, the door is open and the horse is bolted, and you'll yep. never get I it back to of, drink, yeah. you know? No, it's dead right. And I was just an early, early taste of having an opinion that people don't like. And, and you, you know, had a police people. raid on you on the yeah. grounds of someone basically having a go at you on social media, right? Yeah, that's right. And I made a humorous tweet, which everyone knows was humour. It was humour. Yeah. And $14,500 later, I got my guns back. Yeah, yeah. So people need to know that this... And it's, it's in my bones because I've been through it. People need to know that we are losing democracy here and we need to start fighting that yeah See, i didn't realize we had so much in common i i handed seven of my, of my weapons back all seven of them about two weeks after right. the mosque shooting and that was a debacle in itself and we didn't have time to talk about it now but during the first lockdown i had two raids mm. here by the police 
at my apartment. They just came anonymously and knocked on the door. They were anonymously tipped off that I was up to no good. As it transpires, I was feeding 200 people a day from home, which is quite some challenge. You've got to cook in big 20-litre pots. But because I was going in and out of the house to go down to my restaurant to get equipment and get supplies and stuff, they said I was going in and out of the house so many times. And I said, well, what's the limit? How many times am I allowed to go in and out? Well, there isn't one. But you just told me I'm going wow. in and out too many times. So they came twice. Wow. I've got the name of the second cop. His name was Jordan. I should tell that story one day. I should tell it to the media. Yes. Wow. Yeah, you should. Yeah. You guys are going to get on. Anonymous I've got to, you are going yeah. to get you guys together with a bottle of wine at some stage. Um, oh, definitely. Yep. I'm going to say yep. this first, simply in introducing people, it's like an intellectual Tinder date. Um, Rachel and Leo <laughs> seem to have got on. I still don't have... I still don't have a title for this program. Very, very quickly, uh, we're actually past nine. Uh, All Blacks, win or lose, Saturday night, or don't care. Rachel, go. Don't really care, but I suspect they'll win. Leo? Win by a long, long way. Argy to be complacent. It's all the top one percent where it's decided. Okay. Leo, come back from South Africa. Rachel, I think, Leo Malloy, Rachel Stewart, I thank you both for being my inaugural panellists on the yet-to-be-named uh, Friday wrap-up uh, panel. Thank you both for your time. Rachel Street, Stewart and Leo Malloy there. That's it. We're done for the day. It's 9 o'clock. It's news time. Have a great weekend. Don't forget, Marty Devlin joining you early after Michael Law's 12 to 3 today on the platform.